Hello students, I am Professor Geeta Bansal from Punjab University, Chandigarh. Let me just introduce you to what is a group. Well, a group is formed when two or more people come together for some activity, which may be either a social activity or an anti-social activity. The group usually has a common set of objectives and interact for quite a long time. On the other hand, teams are a group of people who have a combined pool of knowledge, skills and abilities and who come together for the achievement of a common goal or objective. All work teams are groups, but all groups are not teams. This is to be understood more specifically and you must remember it always. Let us try to understand the importance of groups. Here you will get to know as to why people tend to join groups. I'm sure most of you are a part of one or the other groups, either in your organizations formally and of course informally. And I'm sure you people are more fond of your informal groups vis-a-vis -vis the formal groups which are a structured groups in your organizations which happen due to the nature of the organization structure you are working in. Now, the importance of groups can be understood by its very nature. Here, people are associated with each other because they have common interests, as has already been mentioned. Apart from this, there are or there could be some needs like need for companionship, need for survival and security, need for affiliation and status, followed by or some people have a higher need for power and controlling others. On the other hand, there are some individuals who want to fulfill their need for achievement. Let's understand one by one. What is need for companionship? Well, here the group provides the members an opportunity to be simply in the company of other people who share common interests. The need for survival and security being a part of a group satisfies the individual's need for safety and security. The individuals, they join the groups for enhancing their affiliation and status. As by joining a certain group, it enables them to enjoy a better status and enjoy a higher level of affiliation. Sometimes the members or the individuals have a higher need for power and controlling others. And they become a part of a group where they have an opportunity for assuming leadership roles and it gives them an opportunity to exert a certain amount of power and influence over others, which satisfies their need for power and control. And that is why they want to join that group. Then there could be individuals who are very high on achievement and these groups, they help these individuals in achieving more than they could have achieved alone or individually. Now, the organizations typically form groups to accomplish work-related tasks, as you already know. However, a member of a work group may unintentionally reap numerous benefits that are independent of each other. Before we move ahead, let us try to find out what are the characteristics of groups. There are four basic characteristics of a group which can be seen one in a clear purpose and a clear mission that the group stands for or it is striving for. The second characteristic of a well-defined group is that it has well understood norms and standards of conduct. The third characteristic could be 
that there is a high level of group cohesiveness. The fourth could be flexible status and of course the structure of the group. Now at this juncture it would be not out of place to make you understand that group behavior has caught the attention of social psychologists for a long time and they have outlined two major aspects of group behavior which should be looked into. These two aspects of group behavior which distinguishes one group for another are group cohesiveness and social loafing. Let's understand what is group cohesion. Now group cohesion is a phenomenon which can be understood in terms of interpersonal glue that makes the member of a group stick together at all times as it eventually leads to higher levels of performance. Now it's quite possible that the groups differ in their cohesiveness as it's the degree to which the members are attracted to each other and they're motivated to stay in a group. Now it's important to understand again that cohesiveness is important because it has been found to be related to group's productivity. If a group is more cohesive, it has shown to be highly productive and vice versa. The relationship of cohesiveness and productivity depends on the performance related norms established by the group. If performance related norms are high, a cohesive group will be more productive and if cohesiveness is high and performance norms are low, productivity will be low. Now, another important thing which is to be understood is if the group cohesiveness is low, how can it be enhanced? Because in any case, to increase the productivity of the group, group cohesiveness is absolutely necessary. Let's find out the methods of increasing group cohesiveness. There could be around five to six methods of enhancing group cohesiveness as one, the group can establish smaller groups with limited members having some commonalities in their approach and behavior which could be quite fruitful in enhancing group effectiveness. That means smaller groups leads to group cohesiveness and it's a well-known fact. You see around yourself and you can visualize that the smaller groups are more cohesive vis-a-vis -vis larger groups. Now secondly, they can intend to encourage the members to be in agreement with the established group goals. So, the second point in enhancing group cohesiveness could be encouraging members to agree with each other unless or until there is a major point of discontent or dissatisfaction. Then of course, when the group members are allowed to spend more time together, it will definitely increase the group's cohesiveness. Now, another method of increasing group cohesiveness could be making the group membership quite difficult by adopting stricter membership norms which will enhance the group status. You must have seen that if you want to become a member of a certain group whose fees is very high vis-a-vis -vis the other group and there is a certain amount of celebrity status attached to that group and if they make it even stricter to be a part of that group, it enhances the status of the group. And on the other hand, it will lead to higher levels of group cohesiveness. 
then another method of improving group cohesiveness could be stimulating healthy intergroup competition of course rewarding the group efforts rather than the individuals will or is an other sure shot method of enhancing group cohesiveness well my dear students you must have heard about social loafing uh, well the phenomena can be understood in terms of lack of concerted efforts on the part of individuals to contribute their time and energy and efforts to the common goals of the group whereby they can easily bask in the glory of others without doing anything for the group this happens when the individual thinks that his contribution is not measurable or he thinks it's not observable directly and also when he feels isolated and has a sense of inequity in the group it's quite detrimental to the group in terms that the group loses on the contribution of the person's abilities to the achievement of the goals however this problem can be controlled by identifying the individual's contribution and by also fixing up individual responsibilities in the group and submitting self evaluations for the assigned responsibilities this will automatically lead to less social loafing in the organization thus understanding group behavior in terms of its cohesiveness and social loafing are of paramount importance in the group which should be well taken care of before the group is formed elements of a group structure let's understand what are the elements of a group structure first of all let's understand what is a group structure a group structure is the internal framework that defines members relations to one another over time the most important elements of group structure are roles norms values communication patterns and status differentials now you need to understand what is a role this is one of the structures of a group well it can be defined as a tendency to behave contribute and interrelate with others in a particular way roles may be assigned formally but more often are defined through the process of role differentiation in a group and role differentiation is the degree to which different group members have specialized functions functional or what we call them as task roles are generally defined in relation to the tasks the team is expected to perform over a short period of time or a long period of time during that group achievement other types of roles are the socio emotional role which helps in maintaining the social fabric of the group the individual rule role and the leader role now comes group norms group norms are the informal roles that groups adopt to regulate members behavior norms refer to what should be done and represent value judgments about appropriate behavior in social situations although they are infrequently written down or even discussed norms have powerful influence on group behavior and the group members are supposed to follow the norms if they want to remain in group let's understand what are group values group values are goals or ideas that serve as guiding principles for the group like norms values may be communicated either explicitly or on an ad hoc basis values can serve as a rallying point for the team however some values such as conformity can also be dysfunctional and lead to poor decisions by the team communication patterns now the communication patterns they describe the flow of information within the group and they are typically described as either centralized or decentralized with a centralized pattern 
communications tend to flow from one source to all the group members. It tells us about the status. As you know, status is a socially defined position or rank given to groups or group members by the other members of a group. Now, status is usually derived from one of three sources. These could be the power a person wields over other persons in the group. Secondly, it could be person's ability to contribute to the group's goals, which is more than the others, of course. And third, it could be the individual's charisma or his personal characteristics, which gives him an enhanced status in the organization or a group. Group formation and development. It's important to understand how the groups are formed. First of all, the group formation can assume either a formal connotation or an informal nature depending upon the objectives it intends to achieve. Now, the official groups are called the formal groups, which are defined by the organization's structure with designated work assignments, establishing tasks where the individual behaviors are well stipulated by and are directed towards the achievement of the organizational goals. While the unofficial groups which are formed in the organizations are called informal groups, which are also called alliances that are neither formally structured nor organizationally determined. These are basically formed to satisfy the individual needs which are not fulfilled in the formal groups. Just a recap of what the groups are. Where two or more individuals interact, they are interdependent or who come together to achieve particular groups could be called as groups which are again formal or informal. The formal ones are defined by the organization structure as has already been outlined, while the informal groups are neither formally structured nor organizationally determined. Now let's try to understand how a group is developed. Group development is very important to be understood. Now you must know that group development focuses on the somewhat unique way groups are formed and the way they may change over time. There are a variety of development theories and some suggest that groups develop through a series of phases culminating in effective performance. Well, the group undergoes predictable stages of development after its formation and leads to the creation of mature groups if all the stages of its formation have been negotiated successfully and it is acceptable to all the members of a group and they agree to contribute as desired. Now, it's very important to understand the models of group development in order to have a better understanding of the groups. There are three most commonly accepted models of group development, which would be discussed in a short while. The first is the Benes and the Shefford four-stage model of group development. The second is the Bruce Tuckman's five-stage model of group development. And the third one is the Connie Gersick's punctuated equilibrium model of group development. The Benes and Shefford four-stage model of group development delineates four stages in the process of group development which follows the group formation. These are 1. Mutual acceptance of the common group goals by the group members 2. Decision making 3. Motivation and commitment and fourth, certain controls and sanctions. Accordingly, the group addresses three issues, the interpersonal issues, the task issues and the authority issues. The interpersonal issues includes the matters relating to trust, personal comfort 
and security for the group members. The task issues include the setting up of the mission and the purpose of the group, the methodology of working by the group, the expected set of outcomes from the inputs by the group. The third issue that is relating to the authority includes decisions pertaining to the leadership of the group as to who will influence power over whom and who will be guiding and telling others about their tasks and responsibilities. Bruce Tuckman's five-stage model of group development. This group development model focuses on leadership and evolution of behavior in teams. It proposes that the team behavior progresses through the five stages in its development, starting with group forming, group storming, norming, performing, and finally adjourning. Let us try to understand these five stages in the group development process in a little more detail for your better understanding. In the forming stage, which is the first stage in group development, the team acquaints and establishes the ground rules to be followed by the team members. The formalities are perceived and members are treated as strangers in the formation stage. Then they move on to the second stage, which is called the storming stage. Now, in this stage, the members start communicating with each other. They start sharing their feelings and viewpoints amongst each other as individuals rather than part of the team. They resist control by group leaders and show a certain amount of hostility. Now, this is one of the most important stages in any group because after formation of the group, storming is a must and the most important stage in any group formation, be it a formal group or an informal group. Now, during this stage, by the end of storming session, the members start to get to know each other somewhat better. Now, they move towards normalizing the situation, which is called the norming stage. Here, people start feeling as if they are a part of a team which is formed to achieve a common goal. And they realize that they can achieve the objectives for which the team is formed only if they accept and listen to other people's or the other members' viewpoints and are empathetic to their feelings. Once they understand this, they enter the next stage, which is called the performing stage. Now, unless the group after storming normalizes, the performance will not take place. So it's very important to perform in a group that the group normalizes. Now, the fourth stage, when it reaches the performance stage, it is where the team works in an open and trusting atmosphere because now people or the members of the group, they start trusting each other. They start feeling good about each other. And there is an atmosphere of flexibility, which is the key and the hierarchy is of little importance now and now the group is intending towards completing the task by performing. Now, once this performance is complete, the group will move on to the last stage that is called the adjourning stage. 
Here, the team conducts an assessment of the year and implements a plan for transitioning roles and recognizing members' contribution towards the group, which is very important. Okay, now let's try to understand the different stages in group formation. All of us undergo different stages when we are a part of a group, starting with the forming stage, the storming stage, the norming stage, and then comes the performing, and finally we have the adjourning stage. Let's try to understand these stages one by one. Whenever we form a group, the first stage is called group forming. Now here, the dependence on the group leader for guidance and direction is very high of all the group members. Because the team members, they're unaware of their respective roles and responsibilities in the organization. And they're looking up to the team leader for answering the various queries with regard to the group's mission, its purpose, and of course, the objectives. Now, as the group convenes, conflict is another important thing that crops up every now and then. Well, conflict, however, is usually low to non-existent in the forming stage as everyone tries to determine their individual role and the personalities to fellow of the fellow members. This stage is often marked by agreeable neutrality while the group takes form and begins to navigate the unknown. The forming stage makes the team members feel like a part of it. That is, they are all a part of a group. As soon as the forming stage is completed, the next stage is of course the storming one, which is the most common one. In this stage, the members, they struggle for power and influence over each other in the team. And storming occurs after the group overcomes this sense of uncertainty and begins to actively explore their own roles and define the boundaries within which they are supposed to work. Chaos, pronounced efforts to influence others, and instances of conflict or enthusiasm are very common in this stage. In this stage, however, the members get to know and understand each other better, especially with regard to how loyal they are going to be towards the group, whether they can be trusted or not, whether they are honest or not, whether what amount of responsibility can be delegated to them? Are they compassionate towards their group members? Do they show signs of empathy? And above all, are they emotionally intelligent? Now, these are some of the factors which are very important in the storming stage. Now, here comes the role of a leader because he is to take up a role as a coach, as a mentor, as a guide to ensure that the storming stage does not extend too much and the people or the members of the group, they reach some sort of consensus to graduate to the next stage of performing. Here, the leader usually adopts a coaching style as there are chances that he might be challenged by the team members. Let's understand these stages a little bit more because this will go a long way in understanding the formation of groups because as it is, you are going to work in groups every time. Now, the first stage is the norming stage where the team begins to show signs of agreement and consensus in this stage. Norming in groups indicate that norms and role ownership are emerging amongst the team members. Generally, this means that conflict and chaos is decreasing or has ended with each member allocated his position role and responsibility in the team. Here, the group starts focusing on the strategies to achieve the desired goals of the organization and start planning and organizing things in that direction, the performing stage. Now, as the team enters this stage, they are more aware of their purpose and mission and are more committed to achieve them than ever before. 
The group has successfully solved the problems pertaining to interpersonal, task and authority issues which has been already explained to you. Now, this is a mature group which is striving towards the achievement of the goals with full energy and enthusiasm. The adjourning stage. In 1977, Tuckman refined the model, existing model, to include the fifth stage to address as to how the group begins to disengage and move on to new tasks potentially beyond the team. Now, this is the final stage where the task has been completed and the team is free to move to newer avenues and things of their interest. Connie's punctuated equilibrium model of group development. Now, this model may be treated as a response to the inability of the five-stage model to be applicable in organizational settings owing to its unrealistic nature as felt by many. Now, this is because the teams usually experience conflict at different times and context. Let's try to understand this punctuated equilibrium model. Now, this model proposes that the groups may not necessarily follow a linear path in a predetermined sequence as outlined by Tuckman, whereby we have already learnt that they follow forming, storming, norming, performing and adjourning. But in the punctuated equilibrium model, it is felt that people in the group follow an alternate path with periods of inertia interspersed or punctuated by visible bursts of energy from time to time. Now, it is only during these bursts of energy that the group's objectives are fulfilled or accomplished. Okay, students, shall we have a quick recall of what we learned? My dear students, you must have learned by now that behavior is constrained by the context in which it occurs. Organizations form groups that determine how employees behave, which may be very different than how they would behave individually. We have command and task groups, both formal. They're organizationally determined, whereas friendship and interest groups are both informal groups, which are loosely banded collections of individuals who share certain amount of commonalities amongst themselves. Group formation and development has been discussed, where three models of group development have been outlined after the successful formation of the mature groups. One is Bennis and Shefford four-stage model of group development. The second one is the Bruce and Tuckman's five-stage model of group development. And the third one is Connie Gusick's punctuated equilibrium model of group development. In the first model that is given by Bennis and Shefford, there are four stages in the group development. And these four stages are one is mutual acceptance of the common group goals, followed by decision making by the group. Third is motivation and commitment which is garnered from the group members. And fourth, there are certain controls and sanctions, sanctions which are outlined for the group members. And accordingly, the group addresses three issues which are the interpersonal issues, which includes the matters relating to trust, personal comfort and security for the group members. Second, the task issues, which includes the setting up of the mission and purpose of the group, the methodology of working of the group and the expected set of outcomes from the inputs by the group members. Third, it's the authority issues. This would include decisions pertaining to the leadership of the group as to who will influence power over whom and who will be guiding and telling others about their tasks and responsibilities. The second model is given by Bruce Tuckman, which is a five-stage model of group development. 
Now, this model suggests that groups form through a process of forming, storming, norming, performing, and finally adjourning. In forming stage, there is a great deal of uncertainty about the group's purpose, structure, and leadership. In the second stage, however, there is a considerable intergroup conflict. In the norming stage, close relationships develop and the group demonstrates some sort of cohesiveness which takes them down to the next level of performing. Now, the model assumes that group becomes more effective as they progress through first four stages. And stage four of performing is the stage where group performance is the highest. For permanent work groups, performing is the last stage in development. However, for temporary committees, teams, and task force, this is an adjourning stage. The third model is given by Connie, which is called the punctuated equilibrium model of group development. Here, the model suggests that group progression is somewhat more erratic. In that activity where it is interspersed with periods of inertia and acceleration as the deadline looms closer. This model characterizes groups as exhibiting long periods of inertia interspersed with brief revolutionary changes triggered primarily by the members' awareness of time and deadlines. This model is limited to temporary task groups and are working under a time-constrained completion deadline. Thank you.